we, we've pivoted now, the church. We've entered into a new season. Our journey to Bethlehem is pretty much long forgotten. Lord willing, we'll make that journey again, but now we have turned our focus from Bethlehem to Jerusalem. We've entered into the season of Lent. We actually began the journey this past Wednesday night, our Ash Wednesday service. We reminded ourselves with ashes on our forehead of, of two basic things. We're all mortal. We're all sinners. The basic message is we're all sinners and we're all going to die. And with a cheery start like that, <laughs> you know it's going to be a fun road ahead, right? <laughs> there is a heaviness to the season of Lent. There's a confrontational tone, really, to the season of Lent. I've always thought Lent was a very valuable time in the life of the church. Not all church traditions within the Christian tree observe uh, the season of Lent. If you come from different uh, theological backgrounds, you, uh, the Lent may even be kind of new for you. But in, in mainline Christianity, it's been something that's been observed for, for, uh, since the early days of the church. And so I, I've always found that it's a valuable time uh, in our own spiritual journeys. And so uh, if you've been with us for the last few weeks, as you hear the story that Sarah just read uh, for us a few minutes ago, uh, it wouldn't surprise you if I, would to, if I were to say to you that uh, there are some overtones or, or undertones, however you want to look at it, uh, from the Old Testament in the story that you've just heard. We've been talking over the last few weeks, we spent time in the Sermon on the Mount and certainly spending a good bit of time in the Gospel of Matthew about how Matthew tells the story in such a way as to help his a Jewish Christian audience really embrace this idea that Jesus has come from the Old Testament. So there are a lot, of, a lot of nods to the Old Testament, a lot of nods to Moses. Specifically, just in the time frame that was listed. Forty days and forty nights, that's the way Matthew says it. Mark and Luke simply just say forty days. John doesn't even mention it. John's kind of in his own theological world out there, so John's not interested in this this forty-day testing. But Mark and Luke say that Jesus was tempted in the wilderness for 40 days. Matthew just adds the phrase 40 days and 40 nights. Maybe that's not a big thing, but it does connect a little more with the Old Testament witness. Moses was on Mount Sinai receiving the Ten Commandments 40 days and 40 nights. The story of Noah and the flood, it rained 40 days and 40 nights. When uh, the prophet Elijah, who, by the way, we saw on the Mount of Figu uh, Transfiguration last week, if you remember that story, we saw Jesus appearing. Uh, he was transfigured with Elijah and Moses. When Elijah, back in 1 Kings, was traveling to Mount Horeb, he fasted 40 days and 40 nights. So I think it's no mistake that Matthew just adds that little phrase. He wants his audience to connect Jesus with the Old Testament. Forty is really a very symbolic, highly symbolic biblical number. There's a lot of symbolic numbers in the Bible. Forty certainly is one of them. Uh, another big forty is the forty years that the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness from their escape or their deliverance uh, is a more appropriate way to say it, deliverance by the hand of God from Egyptian bondage to the promised land. They sojourned for forty years in the wilderness. So this story that we're looking at today, this temptation story, 40 days and 40 nights that Jesus spent in the wilderness, really is the formative story for us in the season of Lent. The season of Lent is 40 days and 40 nights, not counting Sundays between Ash Wednesday and actually Holy Saturday uh, right before Easter. So the church historically has looked at this 40-day period as a time of, of, of really journeying, I like to think of it as a, as a spiritual pilgrimage. We put together, Jennifer and I put together uh, a devotional booklet for Lent. We simply called it our Lenten pilgrimage. So I do think this is very much a, a time where we're invited to go on pilgrimage. Now, we don't have to pack a toothbrush. We don't have to pack a bag. We don't have to go anywhere. This is really a spiritual pilgrimage. It's a pilgrimage of, of heart and soul. 
this particular time frame for the church has historically been that place where uh, people can be restored to faith if they fall away from faith. It's where people can be trained and prepared for baptism. Uh, here at uh, Highlands United Methodist Church, I'm going to be offering uh, during the season of Lent a membership class. If anybody is interested in exploring membership, just let me know. We will be uh, offering a class, and if we have some folks who are interested in that, we will look to bring them into membership on Easter Sunday morning. It's kind of what the church does during the season of Lent. It is a time of preparation for Easter. So it won't surprise you too much if, uh, uh, if I would suggest to you that even as we look at these, uh, these temptations that Jesus uh, endured or, or dealt with in the wilderness, if, if I were to suggest to you that there's even some Old Testament reflections there, Jesus actually makes it pretty clear himself. The first temptation, Jesus obviously is hungry and the tempter comes to him and says, if you are the Son of God, turn these stones into bread. And you heard Jesus reply, it is written, uh, man or humans do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now, Jesus wasn't the first one to say that in the Bible. I bet you could almost guess who the first one was. It was Moses. In the book of Deuteronomy, Moses says to the children of Israel before they go into the promised land, he reminds them that they were hungry in the wilderness during their 40-year sojourn. He reminds them of that and reminds them that God fed them with manna in the wilderness because humans don't live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. And the temptations continue. The second temptation, of course, if you are the Son of God from the pinnacle of the temple, throw yourself down. For it is written, the devil says, for it is written, he will give his angels charge concerning you and they will uh, keep you from dashing your foot against the stone. Did you know that the devil can quote scripture? This was Psalm 91 verse 12. It's in the Bible. But Jesus says again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Do you know who else said that in the Old Testament? Moses said that in the Old Testament. He was saying to the children of Israel, reminding them of that time when they did put the Lord their God to the test, when they were thirsty in the wilderness and they cried out to God, and, and God through Moses made water come from the rock. They called the place Massa uh, because they tested the Lord. They cried out, is the God, is the Lord God with us or not? And then there is that third temptation where uh, the devil takes Jesus way up high, 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 way up on Whiteside Mountain. And he looks down and says, I will give you all of these uh, kingdoms and all of this power if you will bow down and worship me. And Jesus said, away with you, Satan, for it is written, uh, you shall uh, not uh, you shall put no other gods before me, which, uh, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing there, that is a, a reflection back on the very first commandment that Moses receives at Mount Sinai. God says, you shall have no other gods before me. Jesus says, you shall serve the Lord only. So Jesus, obviously very much grounded in the will of the Lord and very much grounded in the Old Testament teaching. So I think it's I think it's interesting, I think it's helpful, again, just to continue to be mindful of how especially Matthew tells a story in such a way to his Jewish Christian audience that grounds Jesus very much in the Old Testament. As I think about this story, as I think about the season of Lent, as I think about us, I think about how we're a whole lot more like the children of Israel in the wilderness in the 40 years wandering than we are like Jesus oftentimes because we don't always win the battle with temptation. We have faced temptation more times than we would like to admit and lost. Of course, it would be easier if, if the tempter fought fair. It would be easier if we really saw temptation coming. Temptation is sneaky. Did you know that? It would be much easier if temptation wore a name tag, right? Hi, I'm temptation. And I'm going to give you an offer that you don't think you can refuse, but you can, and you'll really wish later that you did. Temptation comes in all kinds of sizes and shapes, and we don't always see it coming. I can't, I can't give you statistics to back this up, but here's what I believe to be true. 
I suspect it's very true that all human destructive behaviors started with very small little temptations that just had a way of growing. You know, sometimes we can find ourselves on slippery slopes and we're slipping and sliding before we even realize we took the step. <clears throat> In the, the screw tape letters, C.S. Lewis' classic uh, Christian book, uh, this, this sort of imaginative conversation between Screwtape, who is a head demon, and his nephew Wormwood, he continues to write these letters to Wormwood, encouraging him on how to get his patient, which is a Christian, uh, to walk away from the path and to, and to make his way away from God and toward the devil. <clears throat> and so in one of the letters Screwtape writes, the safest road to hell is the gradual one, the gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. We can easily get ourselves into trouble before we realize we've taken the wrong step. So as we think about the season of Lent, as we think about this spiritual pilgrimage, I would suggest to you that if we will make an authentic spiritual pilgrimage to the cross during this season of Lent, we have to address our own wilderness. Jesus took the fight to the devil. Going into the wilderness really was like the devil's home turf. It was the understanding of that day that the wilderness was kind of where the demons roamed and strange things happened and scary things happened in the wilderness. So Jesus going into the wilderness is significant. He took the fight to the devil. He took it to the devil's home court. It's almost like going into Cameron Indoor Stadium. Some of you get that, some of you don't. And that's okay. But I would suggest to you before we can have an authentic experience as the Easter people of God. We have to deal with the devil within. Wilderness, or the season of Lent, is not always an easy season, but it's a valuable season. It's an important season. It's a season that invites us to look deeply within. You know, sin, again, if it was identified, would be much easier for us. Sin does come in in subtle ways at times. The, the really, the, if, when you think about the temptations of Jesus in this story, at, at really the heart of it was simply the invitation by the devil to just get Jesus off course a bit. <clears throat> Take another step. Go in a, a different direction. Don't go in the direction that God has ordained for you. Just, just deviate ever so slightly. So today I simply offer a, a word of invitation, a word of challenge. I don't know what your wilderness is, you don't know what mine is, but I know that we're all human, so we have them. We have those, those silent sins with which we struggle, those, those thoughts, those behaviors that are not Christ-like, those things in our life that, that we know are not pleasing to God. Now, I haven't come to, to heap guilt upon you today. I've come simply to invite you to allow this season to be a valuable season for you. There's sin that, that hides in the shadows, right? Lent's a good season for us to drag that sin kicking and screaming and cursing out into the light so we can take a look at it and defeat it. John Wesley said that when we come to faith in Christ, John Wesley, the founder of, of the Methodist movement, which became the Methodist Church, eventually the United Methodist Church, when we come to faith in Christ, we, the, the basic understanding is we, we confess our sins, we recognize that we're a sinner in need of saving, and we confess our sins before God, and God saves us through faith in Jesus Christ. And we are born again, born anew, born from above, born of the Spirit, and we begin a new journey. The Christian life begins really in that moment. And however that might have looked for you, if you have in your heart made that decision to follow Jesus... If you have given your heart and life to Christ, if Christ is your Savior and Lord, you are by definition a Christian and you are seeking to live a Christian life. But we all know that even though we are saved from sin, 
And by definition, we would understand that to mean that sin no longer reigns in our hearts and lives, but we all must recognize that though it no longer reigns, it still remains. There is still a remnant within us. And part of our theological heritage, based on John Wesley's teaching, was that uh, we are to continue to war against that and, 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 and enable God's amazing grace to continue to work within us to obliterate that sin. We don't have to have this belief system that says we will always have sin in our life. That really is sort of uh, uh, not consistent with our Methodist heritage, quite honestly. Wesley did say in a sermon one time that, that when we come to faith in Christ, sin is not destroyed, it is only stunned. And it stays with us. During the season of Lent, if we will live this season authentically and well, as we make the spiritual pilgrimage to the cross, we will recognize there are things in our life that need to die. There are things in our life that are unhealthy, things in our life that are not consistent with Christ. And so I, I don't come with any secrets that I know about you, so you're safe. So I'm not preaching to anybody individually. I'm preaching to myself as much as I'm preaching to you at this point. But I do think the season of Lent is a valuable season. And I don't think we get to Easter faithfully without traveling through the wilderness. That's what Jesus did. And I think Jesus modeled that for us. So today, I simply invite you to open your heart. I invite you to take a look, sweep into the dark corners of your soul. Look at those places that you know are not consistent with Christ, that you know are not life-giving, that you know are invitations from the deceiver simply to step away from the path that God would have chosen for you. We believe in the church that there are certain things that we can do to help us along that journey. Wesley talked about the means of grace, things like searching the scripture, things like prayer, uh, things like holy communion, being in conversation, Christian conversation with one another, coming to be a part of a corporate worship experience. As we make our own wilderness journeys, the good news I bring to you today is we do not, although we have our private journeys, we do not journey alone. Look around you, you have a lot of people with wildernesses that they can journey into during the season of Lent. Wesley believed Holy Communion was one of those very powerful means of grace that God speaks to us, that God makes God's presence known to us, that God reminds us of God's presence. And so today, as we begin on this first Sunday in Lent, we begin now this, this worship journey into the season of Lent as we remember Jesus' temptations, as we look to him for guidance and strength, I simply invite you. I invite you to come to the table today. Come to the table to be strengthened. Come to the table to be renewed. Come to the table to be reminded. Reminded that you have been saved from sin, and so sin no longer is in charge. Jesus said to the devil, get away, Satan, be gone. We really can say the same thing to the sin that remains in our heart. You no longer are in charge of me. These attitudes, behaviors, these thoughts that continue to, to try to hold sway, that is not the way it has to be. And the season of Lent is a season to journey deeply within and to look closely and to seek God's guidance and God's grace and God's help. So we come to remember we remember who we are. We remember what Christ has done for us. We remember to whom we belong. So come. Come to the table. Let us eat and drink together the bread and the fruit of the vine, blessed in Jesus' name. And let us make faithful pilgrimage to the cross together during this season of Lent. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. There's a land that is fairer than day And by faith we can see it afar Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by 
by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful shore We shall sing on that beautiful I was standing by my window on a cold and cloudy day when I saw the birds come rolling for to take my mother away. Will the circle be unbroken by and In the sky 